we, we've got a couple of back-to-back -back panels followed by a commentary panel. Uh, and um, the okay, I can talk louder. There we go. So in my head, I have uh, kind of names for for each of the three panels um, uh, in in my head, and I'll, I'll do that as kind of introductions. So the the structure is is we're going to do two back to back panels on levers of change. Um, the first one has got more of a virtual care um, uh, feel to it, and then the, the second panel is uh, more of a clinical needs panel. And then the third group, um, which will be after a break, will comment on the whole day, but particularly on the panels. Um, this panel, I'll, I'll borrow uh, as a quote from uh, David Naylor. As, as you may know, David um, came and addressed uh, the uh, faculty group last night over dinner. And I, I, his speech was off the record, so I won't quote the whole thing, but he, uh, or large parts of it, but I will borrow four words. He, he said, uh, health links were uh, viral and vaguely subversive. Um, viral and vaguely subversive. And so this, is, this panel is my viral, vaguely subversive panel. Because each of these three gentlemen whose, uh, whose bios are, are in, um, that's uh, Dr. Ed Brown, Dr. John Semple, and Dr. Sasha Bacha, are, are viral and vaguely subversive. Uh, Ed, as you guys probably know, has been dubbed by the Globe and Mail, thank you, Lisa, uh, as one of the 25 most transformational living Canadians, to which I say, we are not worthy. Uh, but he's also, more recently, the president-elect of the American Telemedicine Association, which is pretty incredible. So uh, congratulations. Um, do, do, John Semple is uh, uh, chief of surgery at Women's College, uh, and he's vaguely subversive in a couple of different ways. One, he has a, a degree from, the, from OCAD, so uh, there's not that many chairs of surgery who also have degrees at, uh, at OCAD and do medical illustration. And more recently, in the way that I met him, is he's an entrepreneur. He's a co-founder of a company called QOC, which is underneath the PATH project that Kathy Fuchs talked about, and he'll describe that. And then uh, Sasha Bacha, our last panelist, of course, is... I don't think he's even vaguely subversive. I think he's, he's quite openly subversive, because... Uh, because he's, he's currently a, a Mass General uh, Cardiology Fellow. Um, he's returning to head. I'll let him talk about what he's going to return to head at Women's College, or is it on the slide? There it is. Women's College Hospital Institute for Health System Solutions and Virtual Care. Uh, but, of course, uh, Sasha also um, took two years off to uh, be an advisor in the office of the Premier. Uh, which is not something that every Mass General Cardiology fellow does. So without further ado, they're each going to talk for five to eight minutes, and then we'll do a couple of questions up here and then questions from the floor. Without further ado, Ed Brown. So thanks very much, Will. By the way, David Naylor also said that health links are irresistible. That was his line. Uh, so uh, it's hard to follow, uh, you know, Duncan Sinclair, a.k.a. Darth Vader. Uh, and so I've spent the last 20 minutes trying to think of something equally as intellectual to say, and I think I've come up with something deep, which is health links are really, really fun. <laughs> They're great. So is that good? Yeah. And uh, actually, I mean that because I've had a great opportunity to work with a whole bunch of them. Uh, or at least meet with them. I don't know if I've done any work yet. Um, and it's, these people are passionate, they're completely engaged, uh, they're very thoughtful, and they're creative. And it's very exciting. I haven't seen anything like it in healthcare for a long time. You know, I'm a physician myself, and uh, sometimes we get a little depressed, just ask Frank. Uh, but uh, it's really, really exciting to see that kind of engagement among the whole broader health community, see everybody working together. And I hope that if you haven't, uh, had the chance to sit down with one of these groups that you take the chance because it'll really uh, it'll energize you for sure. Uh, 
the other interesting thing today is that we've had a, I've had a great segue for my talk because what you saw earlier today were a couple of interesting slides. If you think back uh, to Dr. Woodchiss's slide with all those different health providers, those little look like a Rorschach chart uh, of all the providers in the community looking after a patient. Uh, if you look at uh, Heather Fraser's, what was it called? The Wicked, what was it called? Pinball machine, or I think you called it uh, a wicked mess, the wicked mess of healthcare. Well, it's obvious that all those people, all those providers and the patients, they need to connect. They need to communicate with each other. How are we going to form those virtual healthcare teams without some way to bring them together? And I think that virtual healthcare or technology is really a central part, it has to be at some point a central part of these solutions. Uh, and that's really what the definition of virtual healthcare is. Virtual healthcare is just about using tools to connect people, to have people communicate and collaborate. Uh, it can be as simple as the telephone, lots of people use that. It can be remote monitoring, it can be video conferencing, it can be M Health, uh, and adding into that things that improve quality. So decision support, uh, education, coaching, when you add that together, that's all, oops, that's all the virtual healthcare system is. So I have a couple slides to tell you what we're up to. Uh, I think, you know, people like me, when we get up here, we're actually really tempted to tell you about the future. Okay, so uh, we want to be wizards, you know, and kind of predict and be seer about what's going to happen next. Uh, but I've, I'm taking advice from Danielle, who said, let's get down in the muck. Okay, and so what I want to do is get right down into the muck. I don't know if my slides are here. That's me. Okay, that's us. Uh, yeah, whoop. Oh, this is the wrong slide deck. Okay, I'm going to wing it because I got the wrong slide deck. So there was a slide here that said uh, what we have, uh, what, what, we're, what we're talking about today is the here and now. Okay, so it's the here and now of what's available in virtual healthcare. And without the aid of visuals, I'm going to tell you what's here and now. So number one on my list is really uh, clinical video conferencing. This is something we do across the province. We have over 3,000 hardware-based systems that look like this. Uh, there's over 1,600 organizations that do it. There are over 300,000 patient consultations last year. And of course, the important part of that is that there are over 2,000 consultants who are delivering this service. So if you're part of a health link, there are probably consultants in every specialty that you require uh, who can help you out. And if you need somebody who's not already using it, you can convince them to do it. So there's very, very powerful possibilities there. I have no idea what the next visual is, but oh. Okay, yeah, this is perfect. So uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're actually trying to make this cheaper, faster, and better. So we now have PC and Mac-based video conferencing. Instead of spending 15000 for a big, fancy system, you can spend like next to nothing on your PC, on your laptop, and you can connect into those 3,000 sites across the province. Very, very simple, very cheap. We're really hoping that Health Links will take advantage of this to meet with each other and to meet with uh, all of their partners across their Health Link. Right? So, to give you some ideas of what you can do, if you think of that wicked mess that Heather showed us this morning, uh, if you're a health link, think about how you could have a team meeting. How do you bring all those providers together to talk to each other? And even more importantly, how do you bring the patient in? How do you bring the caregiver in to that team meeting, right? How do you bring the pharmacist and the dietitian into your office from wherever they are to support that patient? So there's a million ideas that health links can leverage to do this. Let's see what other slides I have here. Sorry about that. Okay, this is another big one for Health Links. So something called eConsult. We're doing this in a, in a fairly large way across the province. We're actually, uh, right now, dermatology is the number one application. So if you think about going to your doctor's office, taking a picture of a funny rash, adding a bunch of data, and then sending that off to uh, a dermatologist and getting a consultation back in a day or two days or three days. Right now, uh, consultations are coming back in under five days. Anybody here ever made a Durham appointment? No? Two months, six months, 18 months if you live in Picton, Ontario? Okay. So it's, it's astonishing. And so you start to think about how you can extend this Q&A, right, this e-consult into other specialties. So we've got tele-ophthalmology. We're doing a wound care pilot. We're about to start a psychiatry, store-forward psychiatry. 
program, infectious disease, you can start to see how you can connect primary care to the specialists and start to get your answers faster. Health links are a perfect place for this. You can imagine a community of providers all working together, being able to ask people questions, avoiding a lot of those consultations uh, that, have to, that, that otherwise would happen and would take a lot of time. So very exciting. Number three, education. So uh, we've got a huge education network uh, for multi-point video conferencing, webcasting, web conferencing. Uh, again, this is completely available to health links. They can uh, acquire education. They can meet with each other. They can plan. There were over 40,000 of these events last year uh, across the province, and it's really, really simple to organize using an online tool. So please use it. Uh, sorry, I'm skipping through here. That's how you do it, by the way. So there's one form. Fill it out. You invite all your friends. They get an email. They say yes or no, and presto, you've got a big multi-point education event for your health link. Uh, this is my favorite topic here, so telehome care. Frank Martino alluded to this, and I think you saw the example of his uh, patient with chronic lung disease. Uh, this is about coaching and telehome care, okay? So this is about coaching coupled with remote monitoring. And don't forget the coaching is the important part because the technology by itself doesn't work. Uh, but if you have the coaching with the technology, this is a very, very powerful intervention. It motivates people people begin to understand their own disease, they begin to look after themselves better. It's very effective in our pilot uh, with CHF, congestive heart failure, and COPD. We actually avoided 70 percent, uh, there's actually a 70 percent reduction in hospital admissions. Sorry, 65 percent and a 70 percent reduction in emergency department visits. So 65 percent reduction in hospital admissions, 70 percent reduction in emerge. Self-reported data, but it was so promising that our uh, ministry wisely funded us to grow this in a pretty substantial way. Uh, right now we have three LINs, Central West, uh, uh, Toronto Central, and Northeast Engaged. There's three or four more that are coming online this year, and we're just very, very excited to see the impact that this will have on, on health care. Um, that's what it looks like. Oops. Sorry, guys. Maybe I'll just quit. So uh, those are the major applications, and uh, please use them. They're all available now. So this is stuff that's available right now, and we're hoping the health links will work this into their plans to connect with each other. The only last point I would like to make, which is not in this deck, is that in my travels, there's one thing that I think is a gap, and that's a very simple tool that health links can use to communicate across their community, to share a care plan, and to communicate out to patients. So if you could imagine a patient with a smartphone, care coordinator with a tablet perhaps, health providers with their smartphones or tablets, they're all working off the same song sheet, right? There's one care plan, they can message each other, they can build the plan, keep it there for the patient and family. I think, you know, my travels meeting with a lot of these health links, I think that's a missing element in most of them, and I think that's probably an exciting place where we have to go next, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, this was uh, Will Falk's uh, suggestion as a title, uh, and uh, I'll try to explain exactly what we mean by that. Uh, the, uh, the, what we uh, would like to do is present uh, a pilot, although the term pilot now is a, a past term. We use the term uh, uh, feasibility prototype uh, because <laughs> pilot has such a bad, bad name to it. Uh, so the prototype that we've just finished at Women's College Hospital and also uh, the project that we're uh, currently working with, uh, which is the uh, Change Foundation Path, uh, Path Project at uh, North Harmonland Hills, which you've heard some about already. Um, so at Women's College Hospital, I'll just go through a disclosure as well at this point. So at, at Women's College Hospital, uh, in our new ambulatory uh, uh, mandate, uh, uh, we've been able to reduce, uh, in terms of surgery, the actual length of stay for some procedures which are listed in the CHI-HI data as over six days. We actually have those down to about 18 hours. And uh, so that's a, that's a major accomplishment. But what we realized when we were doing this was that uh, 
these patients, yes, we can get them out of hospital faster, the length of stay is reduced, but uh, we're actually sending them home and knowing nothing about them. And that it's uh, that first 30 days of a patient's recovery is where all the complications happen, all the readmissions, all the return uh, visits to emergency department. That's a very dense area, and uh, we know nothing of that experience. So what uh, this project was uh, designed to do was to use existing technology in the form of smartphones, uh, put the patient at the center so they actually uh, monitor the data, use the technology uh, to extend, coordinate, and improve post-operative quality of recovery, uh, easy to use uh, uh, in terms of it, the interface, uh, design, uh, we could translate this into any language, uh, uh, including First Nation. Confidentiality, confidentiality had to be a, a really important aspect of it. Uh, telemetry, we had the ability to apply any Bluetooth aspect of this, and built-in metrics for looking at the efficiency and cost savings, and of course, safety. So this is what the uh, interface looked like. Uh, this is an example of the screenshots. So it had to be simple and intuitive. Uh, you can see uh, on your far left uh, is a, a quality of recovery scale. This is a validated uh, QOR9 or QOR40 that we adapted uh, that the patient actually uh, answers these questions on a daily basis. We designed uh, uh, other indicators that we felt were important, uh, included them, which are visual analog scales for pain, and also uh, because we do a lot of breast cancer and breast reconstruction in, in a particular cohort, uh, we, a lot of these patients, when they come back to clinic, when they bring their drains uh, amounts, they bring back little bits of paper with uh, each of the day's amounts uh, uh, written in, uh, and this allowed us for, uh, to monitor that on a daily basis. And this information uh, can also be, uh, we, when I talk about the care, care providers uh, uh, next, and so we had a dashboard set up for the care providers, and the care providers can be uh, the surgeon, uh, the advanced clinic nurse, uh, even the admin assistant, uh, but also can be uh, physio, can be CCAC, and uh, the family practice as well. They can, and we've actually included uh, the circle of care, so even family members can monitor part of this if they wish to. So. You can see that the, uh, this is the, what I would look at if I'm looking at my, my, my list of patients that I'm monitoring, and there's some flags there, and what those flags represent are actually patients that have answered on the extreme ends of those Ligert scales. So they actually bounce to the top, so I know that those are the patients I have to look at uh, first. If I tap on one of those patients, then uh, this is what comes up. And uh, if I can direct you to the, uh, the questions uh, below, uh, you can actually see um, in this area through here. These are the, uh, the questions, a list, uh, not a full list of them, uh, but it, it gives you the uh, quality of recovery indicators that we're looking at in these patients. And there's, as you go across, there's something called a spark line, and that actually is a small graph that, uh, if you tap on it, uh, turns into a full graph of all those points of data that that patient has entered on that specific indicator. And I'll show you an example of that. The, other aspect, uh, the picture sequence across the top, and I might just add to stay relevant uh, that we do a lot of breast reconstruction at uh, uh, Women's College Hospital, and uh, this is probably very close to the uh, procedure that Angeli, uh, uh, Angelina Jolie had. Uh, so just so, so you know that this is a first stage reconstruction for a patient with BRCA1 uh, 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 gene disorder, and uh, uh, we have the, uh, the patient's permission for using these photographs. Um, but there's this whole sequence of uh, monitoring actually uh, matched the, the objectives and the principles that we wanted to, uh, to obtain. But what was it? there were two, several unexpected things that happened. And one is that when we started out on this, we felt that uh, the virtual aspect of monitoring or the virtual aspects of care would actually be a discounted version of reality. But in fact, what we found was that this uh, sequence of photographs was something that we'd never seen before as surgeons. And in fact, even when the patient stayed in hospital for that length of time, we never actually looked at the incisions like this. And um, in, in particular in sequence, uh, there were several things that happened. We ever, were never actually able to see uh, a transition of a wound as it matured. We actually, in, in both cohorts, we looked at orthopedic cohort and a plastic surgery cohort that there were, in, in each of these cohorts, we had one, at least one patient that we could actually see it start to turn pink. And uh, 
And when we phoned the patient and asked, uh, you know, how do you feel? Do you have a fever? And they said, no. And, and uh, we said, uh, have you stolen antibiotics? And she said, no, I, I stopped two days ago. So we were able to phone a prescription in. And uh, I don't have the sequence here because it's a fairly uh, brief talk. But you can actually see the pinkness going away. And uh, we've never actually seen that before. Usually those patients would not know what's happening to them when they come back to the clinic. It's a full-blown infection. The expander has to come out. So it's a different type of uh, observation that we're actually seeing here. The other uh, unexpected aspect of this was that we initially thought that we would be able to reduce the number of later visits with these patients. But in fact, it was the first visits, the first couple of visits that we could totally eliminate because we knew that the majority of these patients were doing fine that they didn't have to come all the way in just to be told that they're doing fine. We could actually see that by, by their, uh, this monitoring system. So uh, just that we had some uh, help with this. Uh, Samsung uh, provided the devices for us. And, and obviously, this is technology that's available in, in everybody's pocket. But Samsung provided devices. So this is a managed device type. Uh, so all the patients had their uh, a specific device. Uh, which was, uh, had a lockdown SIM card and was more confidential from that point of view. Rogers supplied the airtime, and uh, Tenzing supplied the, uh, uh, the cloud infrastructure, and QOC Health is the, uh, the company that owns the IP. Uh, you've already heard about the, uh, the PATH project, which is uh, from the Change Foundation, and uh, this is transitions in care for complex elderly patients, and there is a very comprehensive group of, of health care uh, providers, and uh, QOC Health is actually acting as the, the digital or, or the connecting spine for that group. And so there are certain elements that are important for that. Uh, also, we wanted to put the, uh, the patient at the center again for this. Uh, the patient was involved in the co-design, of, which is a really important aspect of how the interface looks, whether where it sits on the actual tablet or the phone, uh, the colors that are being used, uh, and, and things like security when you log in. Um, uh, you can't make uh, uh, the security aspect so complex that people can't remember their, their passwords and their, and their login information. So there are ways of doing that. Uh, in fact, there's, there's a method out there already that you can take a picture out of your gallery, uh, put, the, put it on your, on your screen, and you can tap on uh, Mary, Mary, uh, uh, dog, Mary, uh, and that could be your password. Uh, so it's a touch screen application, which is already out there. But those are the types of security things that you can use for patients that are, are challenged in that regard. Again, easy to use uh, language, confidentiality, uh, telemetry, and the built-in metrics, efficiency, cost savings, and safety. Again, you've seen this slide, I believe, in looking at the target population for this type of uh, project. And again, the uh, PATH project elements, uh, planning ahead, aging well, my health story, which is a, a unique uh, aspect of the uh, non-clinical, non-physiological aspects of a patient's story as they move through the system, uh, patient-centered uh, care provider model, uh, transition coaching, and, uh, and funding model that makes sense. Uh, and again, these patients also have, uh, are prone to procedures. So this is a patient that's had uh, cardiac surgery, and we have an adapted uh, system for looking at this patient's progress through the first 30 days. And again, that spark line that I talked about, and this, if you tap on that spark line, you can actually see the, the actual profile of that indicator as you go through the month. And this can be done as uh, an individual patient, or it can be done as an aggregate uh, study as well. And in our most recent uh, pilot or prototype at Women's College Hospital, uh, one of the fascinating aspects to the orthopedic group that we looked at was after ACL reconstruction was a simple question like, when can you stand on your, on your leg? When is it comfortable to stand on your leg? And we can actually graph that as an aggregate uh, uh, number, and the orthopedic surgeons had no idea uh, what that was, and they immediately put it into their patient information uh, uh, section. We're also working uh, with... Uh, uh, the Department of Psychiatry at Women's College Hospital looking at uh, uh, decision aid tools for uh, patients with uh, depression and looking at uh, the way that you can uh, manage uh, uh, medications at home. Uh, and this is a fairly intuitive uh, aspect, and the, the design and the functionality of these uh, uh, programs is, is uh, uh, critical for the patients uh, adapting to it. And again, uh, this is the uh, this similar program, but you can see on either side we have worry meters, and um, these are uh, metrics that uh, may 
seem almost uh, too simple, but in fact uh, give you a lot in terms of when you're looking at these patients over time, uh, you can start to see a trend where they feel comfortable or they don't feel comfortable. And even a simple uh, uh, analog scale that slides across where you say at one end it says I feel comfortable at home and the other end it says I need to go to the hospital. If you see that trend going up then you can focus uh, or intensify your resources for those particular patients to keep them at home. And this just gives you an idea of the, uh, the this is a very busy slide but if you look at the bottom group there these are the building blocks or the uh, such as patient profiles, uh, care provider profiles, uh, educational aspects the dynamic data collection, indicator libraries, uh, which we feel are, are very important, uh, research analytics, decision aids, uh, telemetry, and we're also working on aspects of uh, social media as well. Uh, the, there are mobile components. Uh, I'm just going to direct you to uh, the, this part up here, which I think is, is really important, and that's the uh, data integration. So if we're collecting data, in a, system, in a smartphone or a tablet, that has to back up somewhere, it has to stay somewhere. Uh, and this is new data, and that's interesting that we're generating data that's in that first 30 days. And previous to this, the, uh, the actual amount of data that they had for post-operative patients was one phone call in that 30 days. And we are able to generate 450 points of data during that period of time. And, of course, privacy and security is important, and I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Sean. And uh, I'd like to thank Will and, uh, and Anton and Leslie for inviting me. Initially, when Will had suggested that I do this panel, I said I'm completely not qualified to be giving a, a talk here, mainly because I just got on Twitter. Uh, I just barely learned how to use an iPad. And clearly, when you listen to the other talks, uh, they're very, and these guys have done some amazing things. So I think what I'm going to do is take a bit of a 30,000 foot view and talk about systems. And I suspect that some of the things I'm going to talk about might be applicable to other panels, uh, and I hope that's okay. So we all know that there's a ton of these devices that are uh, being developed. And I think you heard Ed when he said virtual healthcare, mobile healthcare um, can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. We've got a handheld ultrasound uh, tool. We've got a pill box. Uh, that uh, reminds patients when to take their medication. We've got uh, monitoring on smartphones from inpatient CCU beds, and we've got automated stethoscopes. You can tell I'm a cardiologist because all this stuff is sort of cardiology related. There you go. Um, the, and we know that this stuff is coming, and we know that it's going to become an increasingly common way we deliver care. Um, many of you probably follow Eric, Top uh, Eric Topol on Twitter. Um, who wrote The Creative Destruction, Destruction of Medicine, who said, the use of secured video virtual office visits will substantially replace physical visits and remote monitoring will preempt the need for hospitals. I got kind of depressed because I'm like, I just spent all this year in training and now I don't know if I'm going to have a job. Um, but, uh, you know, and we know that this stuff is actually happening. So Kaiser Permanente in Colorado uh, has 3.9 million members registered to My Health Manager, which is, a, it is an online suite of tools that allows them to check their own um, labs online, allows them to email securely with their doctor, allows them to refill prescriptions online. And we know that, and I, I'm going to take an, a bit of an American perspective here, that this is a big business. And in fact, is expected to triple to $27 billion per year by 2016. So we know that there's a ton of public and private sector interest in telemedicine and virtual medicine or mobile health. The question that I guess we all want to know is, will it improve care for our patients? And Will said, don't be negative. So I said, OK, uh, I'll be a realist. And um, I, I promise I'm not going to be negative. Um, but I thought I would look at the evidence around some of this stuff. And obviously, I'm not going to present the totality of evidence, because there's a million things. But I'm going to present three specific, I think, well-done trials into, uh, into what's been going on with telemedicine. So the first is, oh, that, I tried to animate. That was actually the most, uh, the, the best, uh, the most technological thing I was going to do today. But this is a very lar uh, large-scale trial of telemonitoring, a telephone-based system in heart failure. 
um, that was done out of the uh, out of Harlem Krumholtz, was a Yale uh, trained cardiologist, very very uh, very prolific. Uh, uh, researcher who basically enrolled 1,600 patients in a randomized control trial of telemonitoring for heart failure and no telemonitoring. And um, if any of you know much about statistics, the hazard ratio for readmission or death with telemonitoring was 1.04, which is essentially negative. Um, uh, you know, some would say, well, that's just disease specific. So what about patients that we're going to see in the health links with multiple medical conditions to prevent hospitalizations? And so this is a trial out of the Mayo Clinic published in JAMA uh, just last year, which basically looked at an average age cohort of 80, again, a large randomized control trial of patients with multiple comorbidities. And what it found was no difference between telemonitoring, and this was pretty advanced. They did blood pressure, heart rate, virtual conferencing, a whole suite of tools for these patients. This was um, a, a, about a 700-patient trial. And again, the uh, combined endpoint of hospital readmission and death and emergency room visits was no different. But what was interesting and not explainable is the intervention arm actually had a mortality of 14.7% in one year versus the control arm, which had a mortality of only 3.9%. We couldn't explain that. And that was, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, maybe it's heterogeneous population, but this was a pretty well done randomized control trial out of the Mayo Group. And the question which I think Eric Topol raised initially was, well, there's going to be, and I think the thing governments uh, are going to be interested in is, well, is this going to save us money? So are we going to be able to, you know, email our doctor and avoid that patient visit? Are we going to be able to not go to the doctor to re refill our prescriptions? This is going to substitute for actually face-to-face -face contact. Well, they looked, remember, at the Kaiser Permanente of Colorado model, and they did a well-done retrospective cohort analysis of users and not users. And what they actually found was that for those in the My Health Manager group, they actually did, each patient in that group had 0.5 more office visits and 0.3 more phone calls per year. So if you're thinking about implementing this at a health link on the way that they did it in, in Colorado, your office practice would have to account for 50,000 more patient visits and 30,000 more phone calls in a, in a patient population of 100,000. So when I was kind of looking at this data, I was like, man, that's depressing. Um, but then, you know, the thing that actually occurred to me was a story that was told to me uh, by a mentor about uh, a great Canadian congenital heart surgeon by the name of William Mustard. So if any of you know, William Mustard was one of the pioneers of congenital heart surgery. And he actually, in 1954, tried to correct what is now known as congenital transposition of the great arteries, which is basically where you have two arteries of the heart that are switched at birth. This is a devastating condition for kids of that age, and most of them didn't last a month. If they did, they lasted up to a year. So he tried in 1954 and failed. Patient died, and many others tried and failed. And it wasn't until 1975 in a Brazilian cardiac surgery by the name of Atib Jatin finally was able to, using the same procedure that was, um, that was initially described by Dr. Mustard, do what is now called the Jatin procedure and was able to successfully correct these kids. This is now the standard of care. And many kids with transposition now go on to live normal, healthy lives. And so the idea here is we're hoping that it's not going to take 21 years but we shouldn't think that this is going to be so simple. And I have some key, I guess, messages that might be applicable to just this panel, but also might be applicable to HealthLink stuff in general. First is that the cost benefits of any of these type of interventions, particularly in the area of virtual care, are complicated. So assuming that we know what's going to happen based on intuition isn't enough because we don't know what some of the unintended effects, consequences are, and if they're going to work. I think Ed said this really well when he said that how we integrate virtual care tools into mainstream health delivery is going to be equally important to the technology. So the example I would give here is stroke care. So in stroke, we use a drug called TPA to bust up clots. But if we just put TPA on the shelf of every emergency room, we actually wouldn't be improving stroke care at all. What was required was an integrated system where we had, we used hospitals, uh, we had advertising campaigns to patients to know when to have a stroke, we had referral networks, we got EMS involved, we actually created teleradiology, which is actually a tremendous, uh, tremendous victory for telemedicine to be able to get remote hospitals to 
get uh, scans to specialty hospitals to know someone's having a stroke to deliver the drug safely and effectively. And so, as you can see, it's not just the drug, but it's the system around it. Just like this, which we often don't think of as a medical intervention, is an intervention is a tool that requires a system to be optimized and effective. And I think this is really important, and honestly something I haven't heard too much today, um, I'm just going to say it anyways, that I think careful study of these sorts of tools, and I'm not just talking about virtual tools, I'll generalize and say any of our complex interventions should be studied and to show clinical value and value for money. And I, I have to say, I'm going to point out, a, a friend and colleague of mine, Irfan Dalla, has conducted a, a, a randomized control trial, which I tend to think is one of the best done studies of an intervention. That's the virtual award. And that took a lot of courage to say, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to do it, and we're going to study it. And I think the learnings that we're going to get from when the results of that trial are published are going to be far more important in terms of our ability to do future interventions like that than what the results of the study are. So I think that, and I think that's the standard for the type of complex interventions, particularly as we begin to roll out these health links, that we should be thinking about in this province and beyond. And finally, what I'm going to say is culture matters, and we've heard this over and over again. I'm just going to give one anecdote uh, from uh, Mass General Hospital. So one of the things is Mass General Hospital, if you go there, is like kind of, it's got a very 1950s culture. So everybody has a doctor. You actually don't have teams. Um, individual patients have individual cardiologists and primary care doctors. And one of the things that happens is doc patients are entitled or they are, give, they are told, you can do this, page their doctor 24 hours a day, seven days a week through locating. And that doctor, if they haven't signed out their pager, has to answer the phone. And the truth of the matter is, is that um, I ask people, like, wow, like, you know, do you guys get paid extra for that? Do you get some bonus? Do you get some incentive? And they don't. And I ask them, like, isn't that, like, burdening? And they, they just look at me and they say, that's just what we do here. And I think, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, how is this going to affect providers, how we work together in teams and incentives. And sometimes I think there's got to be stuff where we just say, this is the standard of care, and this is what we're going to do, and we're just going to do it. And I think this isn't stem cell therapy. I mean, this is just answering the phone. And when you think about it, <laughs> when you think about it, the truth is, is that we've obviated the need for any workaround, such as, you know, um, 1-800 numbers and, you know, secured link-ups and all these other things because people just answer the phone and answer their page. So something as simple as that can be important. Finally, I'll just end by saying I'm not just going to be a realist. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. So I'm, we're starting this thing at Women's College Hospital called the Institute for Health System Solutions and Virtual Care, where our goal is exactly what I described, that we're going to develop, evaluate, and implement evidence-based solutions with partners, hopefully within this sector and beyond. And I think what we want to do is work with our partners in this virtual care space, develop and test these solutions in a real-world laboratory, either at our place or at your places. Uh, and we look forward to working with all of our partners who are interested. We're going to work with Ed, work with John, and, and, and many, many others of you uh, in this space. And we're happy to work with anyone, and we're happy to, uh, to be in, involved and embark in this very exciting uh, process. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go to the audience for questions um, almost immediately here, but I'll just start by asking Ed and John uh, to both comment on kind of how they see uh, evidence and, and the process uh, uh, for evidence as, as some of the innovations roll out. The evidence-based uh, uh, analysis, I think it's really important. I think that uh, what I've uh, learned is that uh, Efficiencies and cost savings uh, in healthcare is very complex, and, and it's, uh, you, you want to uh, make sure that if you are uh, uh, providing an innovation in one area that you're not uh, uploading sort of the responsibility and, and costs in another area. So I think that it, it has to be uh, properly assessed and, and uh, in a longitudinal sense. Uh, I, I might just add, though, that uh, this area moves extremely fast, and I think that if you feel that there's an opportunity, then, then there has to be... Uh, ways of looking at it that may not be as longitudinal as uh, some of the other ways that are currently out there. Uh, well, we all love evidence. You know, we'd love to have evidence. So when I was a, a doctor way back in the Stone Age, 
uh, about 20% of what we did probably had evidence. So I guess what's, what do you do with the other 80%? You just give up? You know, if there's no evidence, go home. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do with you. So I think the issue that I see right now, when you're talking about health systems and healthcare delivery, I think it's the processes that we have to work on. Um, and it's going to be pretty hard to find evidence for how you set up your relationships, your connections, your communication. And a large part of this virtual care is just supporting that process of care, that process of collaboration. Are questions from the audience? Um, okay, uh, fee schedules um, and how we're paying for this stuff. Uh, where, 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 where do we stand on that and, and where should we stand uh, um, both on the big system side but also on the smaller innovations? Sure. Well, in terms of uh, fees right now, so if you do video conferencing, the province will uh, pay physicians for their services. They'll, they just bill through OHIP. The money comes from another pot. So that's kind of working at the moment, but it's still not an insured service. Uh, but as you know, Will, there's a bit of a miracle in the last year where the, uh, through the ministry and the OMA's uh, negotiating pro uh, process, uh, they set up something called a virtual healthcare side table. And uh, that side table came up with really a plan and a strategy, the development of a working group to really come up with a set of real fee codes. I personally think that virtual is not a whole lot different from face-to-face uh, -face and that people should just pay it and just forget that there's something virtual in the middle. Um, I, I think that uh, when you're introducing a, a system like we were suggesting, then people want to know if there's any, uh, they're, they're missing out on a visit, is there some form of remuneration that might help? Uh, and I think uh, the ministry is maybe getting closer to a, a, a physician and patient uh, uh, sort of fee aspect of it, uh, but but I think there are other other savings in there. I think that the fact that uh, 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 specialists are not seeing as many uh, follow-ups, uh, see more new patients, so there's actually uh, shortening of wait times, but also uh, an increase in the number of consults they're seeing during that period of uh, clinic as well. So, but but as with uh, other health link models, you, you're talking about. Uh, changing where the payments are coming and how they're coming. And that's a necessary change that you, you're going to have to see to enable, or are you going to stay in pilot and just justify it on a care basis? Well, I think it's going to have to be a bit of a combination. I mean, ultimately, you can continue to pay for things in a fee-for-service way. And I think, obviously, when you adopt something, you're going to have to create some incentives for people to use new technology. One of the things that telemedicine, like we're thinking about teledermatology at Mass General, but one of the challenges is also going to be how you're going to pay the docs, not just in terms of, um, you know, for the initial consultation, but they also do biopsies and they do other things that actually, you know, earns them income. So there's there are challenges that need to be made, but I think eventually, if we're really thinking about being serious about this chronic disease management stuff, we might have to go into a bundled payment model where some of this stuff is just not paid. And, uh, but if you provide good, high-quality care, just like in an ACO model, you'll get to keep some of the difference. It's often said that <clears throat> fee-for-service, pay by the piece, you get a lot, get too many pieces. You go with capitation, you get too few pieces. How do you think virtual practice is going to reconcile those two principles? Uh, I, I think you have to reverse that question, right, because these technologies are really just enablers, right? Every one of these requires a system. It requires some kind of healthcare intervention. It requires a group to want to do it and to need to do it. So as those programs get developed, paying for this will become much less of a problem. Optimize why are you the czar? You are the czar. Oh, I am the czar for the day? Okay. Uh, well, it's an interesting question because I think, I think that, uh, you know, what I would like to see in the healthcare system is I would like to see primary care folks being able to communicate effectively with specialist folks and avoiding all of those wait times, all of those unnecessary visits. How do you do that? I guess you get people engaged through things like health links. 
you get them talking to each other, you get them to agree that this is better for the ecosystem, and then some genius like you will figure out how to pay them for that. Okay? But that's the thing is they have to want to do it, and then those problems will go away. You also want the public, right? So how do you, these are patients at home. They need to see their providers from their home. They need to know what their care plan is. Their caregiver needs to know what it is. They should be able to email their health provider. How many of you can email your family doctor and ask a question? See, what, I guess one of the yeah. challenges, just quickly add, one of the challenges in the U.S., the reason this is becoming so popular is because when you have a, A, from a provider perspective, if you can, you know, see 10 patients virtually at like, uh, you know, $25 a pop, you know, and it doesn't take you as much time. You can see more patients, you get more throughput. Also, the co-pays, in fact, in a lot of insurance plans are lower to do a virtual visit rather than an in-person visit. So from a market share perspective, from an income generation perspective, and from a patient perspective, they don't have to pay the copay. You know, but you can see all kinds of perversities that get incented into this. So I really do think if we're really going to solve this, you know, the ACO kind of concept or medical home concept where we pay for a population or pay for, uh, you know, a bundle payment. And what you do is then you, can, you, you end up branding and you can say, well, this area, this health link could be like high quality. We're going to go virtual and we're going to embed this as part of the quality, um, as part of our quality framework. Maybe that's the way to go. I, I think it is fair, though, to say that on the family health team side, on the fully capitated family health team side, we are seeing a lot more messaging, both secure and yeah. insecure, Absolutely. happening. Um, and uh, how we bring that together is, is interesting. I think we had a question here. Yeah. And this is directed at, at, to Ed. Um, Trish Dwyer from Health Quality Ontario, but my previous background, uh, I was the telemedicine project manager in Newfoundland for the province of uh, chronic disease prevention and management. Can you comment, Ed, and, and from my experience, the benefit uh, of that increased capacity, the knowledge exchange that happens at that level uh, by by having those interactions with the specialist, with the uh, with the primary care providers, and um, from your experience, and, and I know it will be similar to what I experienced, but for the rest to hear from you, uh, just how valuable that is and how important that is as a result of being able to connect. Right, yeah, so I, I think what you're referring to is the challenge right now, you know, in the communication level between primary care providers, specialists, and frankly, you know, anybody on the care team. So the classic primary care example is you, you send a referral note off to the specialist. Many, many months later, half a year later, you get a note back. You can't remember why you sent the patient. Uh, you, you, you really don't know if it's still relevant. Uh, it's just completely disconnected. And so we have to improve that. I mean, there's no question that that's a, a huge element. I think what you're referring to is the learning and mentoring that happens. So when you get an answer right away, uh, when you have somebody who, you, who either beams into your office or who sends you a message, there's a huge learning curve. And I know, you know, we haven't measured this, but in other telemedicine networks, uh, the referrals actually drop off because primary care begins to actually know how to manage those diseases better. Okay, I'm going to, um, okay, I'll take one more question. I, I love technology. Uh, one of the things I used to read about years ago was the whole idea of artificial intelligence and a virtual doctor where you could ask a bunch of questions and they'd give an answer. And I noticed uh, there wasn't any discussion of that here. Is there any work going on in that area? It seems to be a huge opportunity to me. I'll, I'll, uh, I, I'm sure Sasha can comment on this as well and perhaps add, uh, I've in my reading, I've come across groups that are working on algorithms where you, if you plug in certain elements of your condition, that it'll flow through and, and uh, give you an answer, although I, I think that it's, it's very early days on that type of, that type of system. But I, I certainly know that people are, are working on it, uh, for sure. Well, I, mean, I think the sponsor of this conference gets a plug here because you probably all heard of Watson. Uh, and so Watson's trying to do that. It's not going to take the doctor away yet, but it's certainly perhaps a better diagnostician than many of us. Uh, and there is technology out there that's just better and better. Like right now, for example, you can have a retinal uh, photograph read by a machine, and it's uh, very accurate. So more and more there is going to be automation of these processes, but there's probably still a job for doctors for a while.
Yeah, I suspect for the health link patients that we use complex chronic patients that may not be uh, so easy to do. I do know that like companies like Walmart and stuff are actually putting a lot of money right now into creating care pathways that eventually will be automated for simple diseases. And, but a lot of that is to deal with a huge section of the market in the U.S. that's either uninsured or underinsured. And so can you do like urinary tract infections? Can you, you know, eye infections, otitis media, those sorts of things that could be easily automated um, they're looking at that. But I suspect from the health things perspective, I think these complex patients probably may. Yeah, I, I think the way to think about it is that, that this year is Watson's last year as a resident. Uh, I think Watson is, uh, I think I'm correct in saying Watson is writing the boards this year. And so, uh, and of course, Watson will be board certified in, oh, everything. Um, and uh, Watson will be, I don't know it'll, if Watson will pass all the boards this year or not. Maybe that will take a couple of years. But I have seen a projection that says that Watson will be on your smartphone within 12 years. So 12 years to a smartphone, which, you know, sounds crazy, except that your smartphone today or your iPad today is about as good as the Cray supercomputer super of 1986. So when you start drawing those log curves, they, they go pretty far, pretty fast. Uh, thank you, though, for all of the perspectives and for giving a balanced view. The three of you really did a great job in kind of painting the, uh, the art of the possible and making sure that we're thinking about it uh, from a number of different points of view, the, the government point of view, the entrepreneurial point of view, and the reasoned evaluative point of view. So thank you for being viral and vaguely disruptive.